for <laughs> giving us your time here and answering our questions. First of all, I would like to ask you, how do you see your profession yourself? Is it closer to interpreting or to subtitling? What would you call yourself? If I would have to position myself and see how I'm seeing myself professionally as more as an interpreter, as a translator or anything, a, a linguistic person, um, well, sometimes I think it's a combination of all. But while I'm working, I'm recognizing that my interpretation skills are the most helpful to, to do what I have to do currently. So I would say that a good training in interpretation would always help and support all the needed skills to do live interlingual uh, translation. Um, what type of intra or interlingual live subtitling do you do? And for what context, what genre, what do you work with? So what kind of inter and intralingual subtitling I'm doing, that's actually a long list, I think. I am working for one of the Flemish broadcasters in Belgium, and my daily job would be to subtitle the news. I do there the, the intralingual uh, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing, so the 888. Um, but on top of that, we also combine it directly with the open subtitling, which is not completely live, um, because normally we will have the text prepared and then put it live on screen. So we would say semi-live. But sometimes the journalist is not having the time to write the text at all. And so we will also well, listen to the, uh, to the video that is coming in just some seconds before it's going on air and then making the live translation just before it's going, uh, just before we broadcast it. And so there we do the interlingual uh, live subtitling um, without any delay even, but bef because we have the video a bit earlier, we can uh, just make sure that the subtitles are on time. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we do these uh, crazy programs such as Belgians Got Talent, where they put an, uh, someone in the jury that is from another country, mostly an English speaker, so we need to subtitle that person live during the Belgians Got Talent show. Of course, also there we work with delay because people are not used to see programs with delayed subtitles. So um, we work with one minute delay and our worst case scenario was 30 seconds delay. And that was for the final slot of the program because in the beginning we could afford to have one minute um, and asking the people in the audience to not text results or doing things. But towards the end, when they announce uh, the winners, you can't have the people sitting in there already putting results on, on Twitter, for example, while it's not yet broadcasted in the home. So that's why they went to 30 seconds, but also because they work with televoting. And to make the, the feeling as real and live as possible, they wanted to have it shorter. It's yep. really interesting to hear that you actually have a one minute delay. I, I, we have one minute delay and, and I hear that we are one of the shortest ones. Really? Um, yeah, and I, I, I know in other um, broadcasters work with 10 minutes of delay or five minutes delay. Uh, but of course, the results that would get out after 30 seconds of delay or one minute delay compared to five minutes of delay, it's a huge difference. The time that you get is, of course, also improving the quality. And besides that, yeah, we do, we do, I do all uh, kind of actuality programs, everything that is related to live uh, shows, live programs. Um, but the news are aired without delay. And the, the news is, is uh, indeed without any delay, okay. yeah. Um, how long have you been doing this and how often do you do it? I'm going to reply one more thing, so then you can cut and take what you need, or the person is going to do that. Um, what, we, what we also do is when we have a, a live intervention on television, and someone is speaking another language, then they would normally put on the screen live translation via 888. So instead of having open subtitles that would come too late, we would have the subtitles offered via teletext, but still the translated subtitles. So not Dutch-Dutch in my case, but then English-Dutch or French-Dutch, for example, 
and there the, the news uh, person would say, if you want subtitles or you would li like live translation, please go to teletext. But for you, that's one step, then you do interlingual. And then we do interlingual subtitling, yeah. Um, regarding interlingual live subtitling, you already said there is a demand. How big is it, and do you think it will grow in the short to medium term? So for interlingual subtitling, I think that the demand will grow drastically even because our world is more and more interconnected and we are all promoters linguistically of our mother tongue, our native uh, language. So we would like to offer as much as things possible into our own language, but yet the inputs that we receive would often be, for example, in English or in Belgium, also in French. And then you would like still to, to give the right results live to our people. And there you need then this interlingual, uh, yeah, interlingual exercise. I, I'm always confused by intralingual and it's interlingual. So they should totally invent understand. other names to describe yeah. these two things. So, yeah. So I think it will be like we, we have now the, the Netflix generation. We also are the generation of the, the video now. Um, I would like to see something now, even if it's happening on the other side of the world. I would like to see it now and I want to have the, the real user experience. But if I don't understand the language, I want also the subtitles now or I want the translation now. So I think there's a growing demand. And I also see that in the area outside of television, more in conferences or um, well, big, big work gatherings, for example, that people um, are trying not to work with interpreters or simultaneous interpreters anymore because sometimes it's taking the, the attention away. So again, if I would go to my, my own reality in Belgium where a conference would be in French, the people that would be sitting in the audience and are native Dutch would normally understand enough of the French to be able to follow. And thus to listen to an interpreter might be a little bit annoying um, because they would like to, to listen in fact to both while listening to the native speaker in front and then having subtitles as a sort of support is sometimes helping um, and, and keeping the attention to the real presentation and, and the real presenter. Um, so you, you offer the services there and people can pick and choose when they need it and go reading if they missed a word or missed a sentence. So I, I have the impression there is a growing market also because the working, uh, well, the, the big companies see advantages in having that kind of support over having interpreters doing it simultaneously. And of course they would have directly also a live script of what happens during the entire meeting. That makes sense, even though like when I watch Netflix and I have subtitles on, I constantly read the subtitles even though I understand everything, so it's really good if people actually listen and only read the subtitles when they need them. Yeah, and, and we, we could add other points that would sell our product. I mean, it's also for, for language training and yeah, it's course. better to, to listen and to read yeah. than to listen and listen because you wouldn't, uh, to an interpreter, you wouldn't listen to the source language anymore. You would also only yeah. listen to the result. And here you, you learn also new words because you are in the language and then you jump out from time to time. Mm -hmm. Or even when you con you constantly follow the subtitles, it is it is helping and improving your your language skills. That's true. Um, so you mentioned Dutch and French. Uh, what languages are involved in your practice? Is it Dutch and French, or are there any more? And what's your view on directionality? Do you think we should only work into our mother tongues? So what languages do I do? Um, as I work mainly for television and you don't know on beforehand what languages will be broadcasted or will be needed, uh, I can't really reply because sometimes I have the impression that my, my boss is expecting me to be like a computer and understanding and speaking all languages, which is not the case. Um, so in the Belgian context it would be mostly uh, English, French, Dutch as main languages, but also Spanish, Italian, the European languages are, are being broadcasted very uh, regularly. 
the main job would stay Dutch to Dutch um, as, as the, the big package, let's say 80%, for example. Um, but all other languages would, would need to be covered. And depending on the person that is in-house and is the re-speaker of the day, you can offer another level or something more. I remember myself doing the real-time subtitling of a press conference of an accident of a bus in a tunnel um, in Switzerland, and they told me it's going to be English and French. And so we started, and suddenly they start to speak German. And I've studied German when I was 15 years old, uh, and I had a German boyfriend when I was on Erasmus, and I was like, okay, um, we're live, let's just do it. And, and so, well, it, it was a summary of what has been said, but at least there were some subti subtitles. It was not the complete story, but there was something. And that's the thing about going live in an interlingual context. You don't always know what's going to come or what will be happening, so you just then do what you can. Yeah, it sounds really challenging. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, and what about directionality? Do you have a view on that? On the? Directionality. Like, um, do you think we should only work into our mother tongue? Uh, okay. That's a, to work only in your own language or in, in both directions, that's an interesting question. I think for me personally, quality-wise, I would always suggest people to work only towards your mother tongue. Um, the results would be better, you, you are more playful with your words. When you are starting to miss parts of the context, you can, well understand and, and make bridges with the, the strengths that you have in, in your own language. Yet I have to say that I had my first experience in um, subtitling into another language. And what I see, it depends on what the person would need or require as sort of support for the event. If they would be okay with sort of summary um, th that's, that's something that you can offer. If they are okay for you telling the same story in your own words in the other language, it would be less strong, but the story would be there. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it would depend on the on the consumer's view or the end user in what is better to have nothing at all or to have basic support um, in two directions. That makes sense. Um, what extent do you think it is feasible to provide high quality interlingual live subtitling for all the contexts and genres that are currently cr catered for by intralingual live subtitling? Well, I have to properly understand the question. So, do you think it makes sense to do interlingual live subtitling for everything that we live subtitle intralingually? But so. Uh, for example, the news in my case is Dutch Dutch, mm -hmm. and then you would offer the same Dutch into English for someone who is native English and would like to. S that's the question, right? Yeah, like TV, live events, everything you can think of. Does it make sense? Okay. Do Does it make sense to do intralingual subtitling and to do the same also interlingual, so to offer more services in different languages? I think that is a question about accessibility and what you would like to offer again to your viewers. I think it's it would be amazing if everything would be uh, accessible in all different languages. Is it realistic? That's that's another question. And what would be the costs and what would be the benefits? And I, I think as a myself being a re-speaker, I would always push for more uh, and more accessibility and more service. Um, but I think as an economic perspective and seeing, well, how many people would we actually serve with this, um, I don't think it's for me to, to make that balance, but something to keep in mind. Um, so, uh, yeah, we would need to see how many people would actually then use uh, these things if we would translate the it, it would be, for example, the, the source would be English-English and then we would do it to all languages in the world. How many viewers would you have, for example, for the Spanish or for the Polish or for the Italian? And would it be worth putting so much human capacity behind it? And for you, do you think that um, interlingual live subtitling requires different 
um, conditions as compared to intralingual life threatening, like shorter shifts, a collaborative approach, something like that? So compared to intralingual and interlingual um, subtitling, I do think you need some other skills. Um, what I notice when I work together with my team, the intralingual re-speakers um, need some time to come to a certain level. And I never had people that would directly start as interlingual re-speakers. They would always first start as intralingual re-speakers, but not all, uh, not all intralingual re-speakers would automatically become good interlingual re-speakers depending on their language skills, their language knowledge, um, but also on their, yeah, on their, let's say, interpretation skills. Um, because when you learn to work as an intralingual re-speaker, you learn to listen, to speak at the same moment, so to do the basic simultaneous exercises and to summarize in your own language, because you can't be like uh, just being literal. You, you have to make it shorter to keep up to speed and to, to make it nice subtitles. So this is something that you train and that you become when you are a good intralingual re-speaker. Now when you have to put that in the profile of an interlingual re-speaker, this person has to do all these same things, but from, another, from one language into another. And this capacity to, to summarize while this is happening in two languages in your head, not, it's not a given for everyone. So in, in training elements, my basis would always be to first start with interpretation and intralingual skills and then see when is the right moment to start combining them. Because in, f in both degrees, in interpretation and intralingual, you need a certain level before you can be a good interlingual live re-speaker. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of um, the entire team around, um, when I'm, I'm talking normally, when I do intralingual re-speaking, I do it alone. I would be the re-speaker, the corrector and the broadcaster all in one. When we work for interlingual um, subtitling, we would normally work with a delay and also with a team. So there would be the first person, the interpreter, who would be interpreter re-speaker, directly interpret everything and just say it. But this person can be or an interpreter or an intralingual trained re-speaker to start doing interlingual. It depends on what language and what quality we have that day. The second person would be the corrector, normally not listening at all at the source language, but only listening to the first person to directly take all out all of the small recognition mistakes that were there because of the speech recognition. Then we would have some seconds later someone that is listening to the actual source language and compared directly with what has been given as subtitles by the first person and rewrite it as proper subtitles. So maybe changing some words, taking some words out, but also editing and putting it in, in a correct uh, way. Uh, and so depending on how much delay you have, you can add more people on that correction side. And then, of course, at the, at the latest spot, you would have someone that is sitting at the real moment of broadcasting and then putting the subtitles live on air. So in, in an ideal setting to give good quality with everything, uh, subtitles, with everything included, you need delay and then you work with a, a team as large as you want it to, to, to give good quality. Again, my experience, the smallest team I had was three persons where we had one re-speaker, one corrector and one broadcaster. For interlingual subtitling. For interlingual live subtitling. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones that I'm the most used to would be for interlingual, would be the re-speaker, the corrector, one person that is following some seconds later, and then the fourth person that is broadcasting live. Mm -hmm. And if you would compare the two, the results of working with four are, are really, really better than, much better than working in a team with three. Mm -hmm. And how long can you keep up interlingual re-speaking? When do you have to switch with your partner? So uh, how long can you work as an intralingual or interlingual uh, subtitler? 
and of course, again, as I am a re-speaker, I would always defend my case and say <laughs> we need to be changed regularly. Normally, as an intralingual life re-speaker, it would be normally every 20 minutes more or less we would try to change. It depends on how long we would broadcast. If we're doing the elections in Belgium, we know that we start at six o'clock in the morning and that we don't end at midnight, but we continue during the night. Then we take longer shifts so that our break is also longer because otherwise even if working 20 minutes is already long you have only 20 minutes of break and you also really need to have your lunch and dinner and everything in between because you continue the entire day so there we might even go to 30 minutes or even 45 minutes with one or two persons and then two others would replace the team so you have uh, again half an hour or more as a break before continuing but that's because it's a long it's a long period um, would that be possible again to do for interlingual uh, subtitling well I would say that normally if we would offer something like that it would be anyhow shorter the program or the event and there would be more breaks um, in, in a live event there would be coffee breaks and I think in, for television, it would be a framed show or it would be a framed live moment. For example, when the president of the United States wishes to announce something live and we would do the live interlingual subtitling, then it would be a press conference, maybe 30 minutes, maybe one hour, or would talk up to two hours, but then we would also have to cut that because television, also the other programs have to be shown. Um, and. I often feel that because of the quality and the capacity that we have, that we just have to go on until it's over. Um, should it be paid then just by minute and by hour in the same way as other jobs are done? No, I don't think so. I think there should be a, a bigger compensation, the same as people do for interpreters. If you are an interpreter for the for the European Commission, for example, you, you get uh, some per day but not per minute that you have been been re-speaking so I think uh, there's still some work to do on the market to make sure that that we as re-speakers don't become cheap human robots just producing language from one language into the other or in the same language but that we're not just a product uh, delivering a service but that we are seen as something additional that is providing the extra quality for which people wish to pay Um, how do you normally assess the quality of interlingual live subtitling as compared to intralingual live subtitling? How do we assess the quality of interlingual subtitling compared to intralingual subtitling? As I'm coming from the field as a re-speaker, we are just mostly very happy when we did a good job and there were enough subtitles and there were not too many gaps and there were no big interpretation mistakes. Um, so uh, we would more focus on the result for the end user, seeing if there's not too many angry reactions coming on, on Twitter at the same moment and so on. Uh, because I'm, I'm not doing the comparison studies for university for example I, I think this is interesting material for for students to do their master uh, thesis on it so no I think it it is for me as as doing it I always end the the moment with a positive or a less positive feeling mm -hmm. and that's the mostly it's already giving an indication like well this went well then normally also the result was well because the feeling is already giving a lot of um, inputs there and then when I have the impression well hmm, I'm not that happy it depends because sometimes my colleagues would say well no yes you missed this and this but the story was still logical and people understood the entire thing so I am having a feeling because I realized that there were some gaps but they might have been covered uh, somehow somewhere or sometimes yeah I go home with a very nasty feeling and being a bit, yeah, I wouldn't say sleep not well in the night, but still I would keep the, mom, yeah, the feeling for a longer period that it w didn't go that well. Um, for the intralingual subtitling, 
I, I, I think myself and my entire team are now on that level that we should always go home with a happy feeling. And for interlingual, I, I'm not sure if that's, if that's ever possible. I mean, I, it would be the same for an interpreter. Is every interpreter going home after an interpretation moment in a happy way? It's so demanding and there's so many different skills playing. It's not only depending on your own skills, but also on the speaker, on the subject, on the, the rhythm, the speed. So I think we sometimes just have to learn to say, well, we did our job, it is what it is, and we gave the best as we could. Yeah. Let's move on to training. How were you trained, if at all? Was it at university? Was it in-house? So how was I trained? I was a student at the University of Antwerp and I was doing, uh, after my Master of Translations, I started the, to do the uh, simultaneous uh, interpretation uh, training. And during that year there was a project ongoing with VRT, which is the, the Flemish public broadcaster in Belgium. And they wanted to start to work with speech recognition and needed some students to do tests and to play with Dragon. Um, and it would not count for our points and we would receive a small corner somewhere in the university with one computer where we would have sometimes access. And, and so they needed four volunteers and no one was reacting. So I said, okay, and three others also volunteered. And so we started to learn to work with Dragon as at the same time we were trained as being interpreters and so uh, I think for all of us it was rather impressive to see that what we were saying was actually then written in dragon pet or in words and that some mistakes came there and sometimes they were because of me sometimes it was because of the, the recognition of the word that maybe the word was not in the vocabulary and and so to start to learn where mistakes were coming from but at that moment we were not having all these inputs yet of these are the natural mistakes, these are the technical mistakes, the dragon mistakes, the recognition mistakes, the personal mistakes, that all these things came later. So it was really the basis. I think it's now 12, 13 years ago when we started that uh, project. And so because I, I was part of that, um, somewhere in June, we were invited to go to a, um, a, a summer course in Italy. Uh, to re well, further define the skills needed and to, to do some exercises working with speech recognition and subtitling. And it was in the middle of our exam period in June and so two persons out of the four were able to go and again since no one <laughs> wanted to go but one, one friend and me uh, because it was not so convenient to do that in, in the middle of the exam period, I can tell. But we, we went anyhow, we, we, we went to Forli, uh, to Bertinoro, to, to do two weeks of, of exercise and testing, but we also learned to the basics of audio description and all the other forms of accessibility. I think that was the moment where I felt like, wow, this is amazing as kind of job. This is so direct, offering an extra service. Um, and I can do it if I, I train this, I do, do, do more of this. And um, well, knowing at that moment the market in Belgium, I also knew that if I would continue to train, that there will be would be real opportunities. And so what happened then? I had my uh, exams in August, of course, because I couldn't do them in June. Um, no, the the day before my exams, the other broadcaster in Belgium uh, called me and I said, well, we heard that you are in a project together with VRT, um, but we would like also to start working with speech recognition for live subtitling. Could you start working for us? And I said, uh, I have my exams tomorrow. Yeah, but we don't care. Can you start working on Monday? Like, uh, well, uh, yeah, of course. And so I started um, in a company where there was nothing yet, no subtitling. And so the, the big advantage that, uh, that I had in my course was that I, I just started with a service that was not existing. So I, I could build, reflect, rebuild it according to the team, to our needs, to the output, to the 
comments of, of our uh, viewers. Um, and so now here we are 12 years later and, and I have a, a fixed team that is starting to do more and more, both intralingual and interlingual. So um, how was I trained? I think I had a big basis because of the University of Antwerp for interpretation that I was given the opportunity to play and to learn with Dragon and that a lot of other things came on the road by just diving into it and somewhere in, in the very beginning when I started to work for VTM, so the other uh, uh, broadcaster, there were some people from the Netherlands um, who came to help to explain the basic tools, the basic tricks um, on how to actually put that free speaking also into live subtitling and so there was uh, yeah, some, some weeks of live training because we already had to provide the live subtitling at the moment because the news was already announced as being broadcasted with live, sub live subtitling so there we, yeah, we had uh, Evan and, and Wim and uh, someone with also with Velotype boards to, uh, to show also the difference between speech recognition and giving the subtitles through Velotype uh, but at a certain moment we said we're going to be quicker in re-speaking let's take over and so after uh, after only 10 days we said we're, we're ready let's do it yeah not bad at all all right we're gonna have to wrap it up but just real quick how uh, what do you think what skills are required to become a good interlingual life subtitler what i think you need as skills to become a good life interlingual re-speaker I think it's based on different phases and different levels of training. I think practice um, is very important, but you need to be able to have certain skills in your fingers. I mean, the keyboard is your friend, not your enemy, and you have to use and misuse your keyboard. You have to have the interpretation skills in your head making sure that you hear language language that you are able to transform it into the other language in a more concise or summarized way that at the same time you have all the basic skills that you need to know what subtitles are because you are not just going to throw text at people you would like to read them subtitles so you also again with your hands but also in the style and how you re-speak put it in subtitles that are having the correct length or speed so people will be able to follow. So the, the skills that you need is, I, I, I don't want to say patience for yourself, but it would be to, to be able to combine all these stress elements because it is life, it is really stressful, but to, a, to be able to combine all these things in a natural way where you say, okay, this is what I hear, this is what I would like to see on the screen and to make sure that it's going through you in a fluent flow so people can continue to follow the story that you are actually making of the original story as been told. What but do you think, what should research in interlingual life subtitling focus on next? What should research for interlingual life subtitling focus on first? Well, I'm going to reply to that question in another way. It is, what do we currently have as support? And what are we missing as kind of support? When I'm working as a live interlingual subtitler, I'm facing problems with technology. And as we know that we are working with speech recognition, that there's already natural mistakes because of the entire recognition process. How can we make the entire bubble around the technical, the technological process as easy as possible for the re-speaker? Because this, this person already has to focus on so many things, doing this live translation, correcting the mistakes, putting the subtitle there. So the entire framework, let's call it the software, for example, to use the, the ideal environment and so on, to make sure that the entire process on which the speaker has to focus would be as easy as possible. So for example, if you are doing it and your software is not giving you the right support to quickly go to a word to correct it but you would have to do it with your arrows for example tuck, 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 before you're there then you're losing time and you already have this as an intralingual speaker that you have to start buffering 
well, if you have to start buffering even more as an interlingual respeaker, that is adding uh, more complex layers on the actual setting and the actual job. And so we'll show even more in results that certain gaps will be starting there. So for me, the research or the cooperation, in fact, that would be needed would be to see how to better improve the situation, the working environment for a, a live interlingual respeaker.